Hello podcasters, welcome to another episode of Living History. Thank you for joining me as we journey through the pages of Australian history. And don't forget, if you want to walk on the ground where the Anzacs walked and walk in their footsteps and learn what the Anzacs went through on battlefields all over the world, visit our website battlefields.com.au and join us on one of our fantastic tours to battlefields all over the world. Coming up, we've got a really special one in October, a visit to the battlefields of Vietnam. This is really important to family members of Vietnam veterans, veterans themselves, or also people who are just interested in this really important chapter of Australian history. So it's the 50th anniversary year of the Battle of Coral and Balmoral, and this is a wonderful tour to walk that ground and pay your respects to Vietnam veterans. So it's leaving in October, escorted by Vietnam veteran Gary Mackay, who won the Military Cross in Vietnam. So don't miss this opportunity. It's going to be a fantastic tour. Now, today's episode of the podcast, pretty special one. I'm getting out and about again. I'm, I'm loving doing this. It's great being in the studio and interviewing historians, but I'm loving getting out and about and actively exploring history. There's just so much great stuff to see. This week, I was fortunate enough to go and visit the HMAS Vampire, which is a ship that served in the Navy for about 40 years and is now a museum ship at Darling Harbour in Sydney. It's at the National Maritime Museum in Darling Harbour, and I really recommend you get down there and see it. During my visit, I videoed the whole thing to show you exactly what this ship looks like. So go to our website, go to the Facebook page, go to YouTube, and check out that video because it'll make a lot more sense to you when you see the footage as well. Uh, But I also did an audio tour as well, so you'll be able to listen along in your cars or during your commute to work, you'll be able to hear what it was like for me to explore this ship. It's a fantastic old ship. I strongly recommend you get down there. If you're in Sydney, go to Darling Harbour, go to the National Maritime Museum and check out the HMAS Vampire. Really special ship, really great chapter of history and really worth exploring. So let's do it now. Join me as I explore the HMAS Vampire. A date which will live in infamy. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, may we say God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor General. There's a second plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I think we have a terror attack. This was our final tower. Hello everyone, I'm here at Darling Harbour in Sydney and I'm really excited because today I'm exploring this, the HMAS Vampire. In the closing stages of the Second World War, a new class of warship was conceived, a ship that would represent the cutting edge of naval technology, the Daring Class Destroyer. And although the war ended before this concept became a reality, the Daring Class became the workhorse of the British and Australian navies for the next four decades, plying the seas throughout the Cold War in Vietnam. Yet despite more than 40 years of dedicated service, today only one Daring Class destroyer survives. It's great to be on board, she's a fantastic old ship. And these World War II and slightly later era ships were designed for speed, they were designed to get where they were going in a hurry. So not particularly comfortable, I can see that already, and uh, I'm looking forward to exploring it. You see these big ships from the outside, but it's not until you get on board that you realise just what life was like on a ship like this in the Navy. I mean, it's cramped, it's busy, it's crowded. You're never on your own. I mean, look at this section we're standing in here. There's 11 or 12 beds around us. Imagine when this was crowded with sailors, the noise, the smells. I mean, you don't realise this until you get on board and see just how cramped it is, how little space you had, how little privacy people had on board these ships. Just extraordinary. James, it's a it's a fantastic ship. It's really impressive. So it's a it's a just post World War II era ship, is that right? Destroyer. Yeah, that's correct. Um, the Daring class destroyers, of which Vampire is one, uh, were designed um, towards the end of the Second World War, and uh, so uh, the war ended. 
but nonetheless they had these designs and the ships were under construction. Um, so uh, they continued that construction on and so Vampire uh, was the last of the Daring class destroyers that were built uh, for the Australians and it was uh, launched in 1956 and it was commissioned in 1959. It's actually the second vampire, isn't there? Because it was there was a vampire during the Second World War uh, that this uh, took its name from. That's right. Uh, there was a vampire one that uh, had a fairly uh, illustrious career in the Second World War, and it was sunk off Sri Lanka uh, by the Japanese in an aerial attack. Um, so when the uh, Daring class destroyers were designed, uh, they all took names of what was called the Scrap Iron Flotilla. These were all these, um, these uh, various vessels that were uh, precursors who had served in the Second World War, and Vampire was one of those. Where did the name come from, Vampire? It's an unusual name for a ship. It is a bit odd. Um, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that those uh, Scrap Iron vessels all had V in their name. Uh, so you had Vendetta, you had Vampire, um, and, and it's kind of a tough sounding name, so sure, why not use it? Fair enough. Hopefully it instilled fear in the enemy wherever they heard that That's uh, right. Vampire was in the, the area. We are the blood-sucking destroyer. We will destroy <laughs> you. Yes. So Vampire started serving in the 50s, so Cold War era, and then she served right through until the 80s. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Um, fairly lengthy career. Uh, was decommissioned in 1986. Towards the end of its career, it, was, it served as a training ship. So starting around 1980, um, it, it went out of active service as a combat asset and, and became a training ship. Because this is a really difficult time in history isn't it? We're talking Cold War here, we're now talking, you know, just towards the end of Korea, we're talking right through Vietnam. I mean, there's a lot going on in the world, and navies were really important at this time, weren't they? Yeah, they absolutely were. Uh, and Vampire was kind of interesting because it served as a transition almost. Uh, in the Second World War, a lot of the fleet assets, warships, they all had guns. They were gun-based um, armament uh, ships. And as you know, the war ended uh, and you see the advent of the Cold War, that shifts. Um, missiles become sort of the predominant armament on, uh, on vessels. So Vampire is interesting because it represents that transition. Um, it always had guns. That was always its main form of armament. But towards the end of its career, they actually started putting missiles on the vessel as well. Oh, so that's fantastic. So this represents the end of one era and the start of the, the more modern naval era. That's right. Fantastic. Well, let's go and have a look around. Sounds good. Let's do it. So James, this is uh, obviously the business end yes, of the ship. Yes, this is it. Uh, so we have, um, we have a 4.5 uh, inch Mark V guns. Uh, Vampire had three uh, turrets like this. So two mounted forward, one aft. And uh, yeah, this is, where the, this is where the business took place. Now this is really fascinating from a historic point of view because ships, historically, warships always had guns. You know, yep. from the, from, for centuries, the idea of putting a ship on the ocean was you'd pile it up with guns and it could blast other ships or land targets away. That's right. That's not how it works anymore, is it? We now have the, the modern era of missiles. And this ship, the thing I love about this ship is it represents the transition, doesn't it? From the old gun style, uh, the old way of fighting a war with guns to the modern way of fighting with missiles. That's Tell us exactly about that. Right. Yeah, so, um, yeah, Vampire came along uh, right on the tail end of the Second World War. And of course, the Second World War was the last conflict that really involved warships that had guns as, as their primary armament. So, um, you know, it, it came in on the tail end of that. It was designed for that. But then, of course, as uh, we move into the 1950s and we move into the beginning of the Cold War, you see this rapid sort of explosion of different types of weaponry. And uh, missiles come to the fore. Um, you know, that's, and that becomes the primary armament of warships moving forward. Um, guns still exist, but not the big guns. They move down to smaller machine guns and quick firing cannon. Um, guns that can really fire a lot of bullets very quickly. So the interesting thing about uh, the guns on Vampire is that they were manually fed. Um, you know, unlike the quick firing cannon that we have today that are, that, you know, each round is automatically fed into the gun and it repeats, you had to manually put a shell into this gun, each of them. Uh, so they would come up from the gun bay, uh, you would load them, fire the gun, eject the shell, and repeat the process. Like all destroyers, HMS Vampire was designed to be sleek and fast, so offered limited space for the more than 300 crew members on board. 
but it's not until you go below decks that you realise just how cramped and claustrophobic life on a warship could be. James, we're in this uh, rather narrow uh, space here. Obviously not designed for tall people, this ship. No. What room are we in? And tell, talk us through it. You know, I imagine I'm a sailor. This is where I'm stationed on board the ship. What am I doing in this room? Um, this is the gun bay for a turret. So one of the forward turrets on the ship. Uh, and this is actually a very critical room. Uh, because what this is, is this serves as the link between the magazines where the shells, uh, shell casings and the projectiles that go into the guns are kept and the guns, which are actually sitting over our heads. So the magazines are underneath us, the guns are overhead. Uh, and what would happen was um, people below in the magazines would send the shell casings up and they would send the projectiles up individually. They would come up through chutes. They would come out, they would come onto these racks, so the upper rack is where the projectiles go, the rack just beneath it is where the shell casings went. And so they would start moving these around, and then they would assemble them. So the shell casing would come up, it would be attached to the projectile, they'd move them along the chain, and then fire them up into the gun room, where they could then be loaded into the guns and fired. It must have been like the working in here. It's so cramped. I mean, I mean, there must have been lots of people in here. Noisy, cramped, hot. Yes. I mean, what would it have been like to 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 work in this room? Um, <laughs> hotter than Hades, I would imagine. Uh, incredibly hot, noisy, very frenetic. I mean, because if you're in here doing work, that means those guns are firing and something serious is going on. Um, and to make it even more complex, you know, as you say, it's very confined. You've got height restrictions. Now I'm okay. Someone your height, of course, would have a hard time navigating around without smacking their head, I'm sure. Um, but in addition to all of that, this bit that we're standing on actually moves. When the turret moves, this all moves with it. And the thing is, the guys up there don't tell you when that's going to happen. So you're down here trying to load shells, which is a very hazardous thing, and potentially very deadly, uh, and all of a sudden the floor underneath your feet literally starts moving. So in addition to all the other conditions, you're also trying to keep your balance as this thing is rotating around. And also the ship is probably moving because of the, you know, the, the swell outside. So let, let, let me just get this straight. It's hot, it's cramped, it's noisy. We're on a rocking ship at sea, and then it moves. The whole room rotates. Yes. That is. This must have been the least desirable job on the ship. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there were plenty of people who probably saw it as a challenge and probably had a great time down here. And I would imagine, like any task, once you do it enough, you know, you, you, you get a sense of it. And you can do it, you know, with your eyes closed. Although I don't think I'd want to do anything in here with my eyes closed, quite frankly. It's, uh, it's just such an incredible, incredible apparatus. I mean, I'm looking here at... It's nothing but levers and buttons and racks and frameworks. I mean, just the, the, the technology, even for this, which is a relatively old ship now, the technology that goes into this, it's just, it's, it's incredible, the ingenuity. Um, basically, the, uh, the efforts people go to to, uh, to to hurt other people, it's incredible. That's right. <laughs> and you, you see it here when you stand in a room just like this one. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think that when you see a room like this, it does give you a sense of how intricate these ships are and how much goes into their design and their construction and their operation. You know, it, it's not a simple matter of load a shell and a gun and fire it. It's, there's much more to that. And this is just one room in the larger ship. Gee, it certainly is tight, James. You, uh, <laughs> you weren't kidding. Yeah, it works for people of my height and shorter, but yeah, someone of your height, it would be very, very difficult to navigate your way around and in here. What, what do we have here in front of us? Well, <laughs> this is a, uh, a voice pipe. So uh, a very sort of analog uh, system of communication, if you can imagine. Um, the guys who were in the gun bay here, uh, this was their means of communicating with the people up in the gun uh, room where the, the guns actually were. That, that's not high tech in no, any way? No, not at all. And it, I mean, given how noisy it probably would have been in here, uh, when this room was in full operation, uh, it would have been difficult because you talk, 
and then you listen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you hope whoever is doing the communicating has excellent hearing and also a nice, big, powerful set of lungs. Imagine, imagine that with the guns roaring overhead. It just uh, can't even. Yeah. No, I, no. I, I can't imagine it worked very effectively. But I mean, this, these have been on ships for centuries. So yes, I, they have. And pretty much all the ships in the Second World War, all the warships use these. I mean, they were the predominant form of communication between decks. Anchors away, my boys. James, the, the thing I love about Vampire is it's not a ship that necessarily tells a story of combat and, and battle on the high seas. This really is an insight into life at sea for sailors, isn't it? Can, I mean, tell us about this room we're standing in now. What does this represent on board the ship? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. One of the things that we've really tried to focus on at the museum is using Vampire as a representation of what life was like for uh, the men who served aboard these ships and women and also um, their families you know we're, we're looking at the bigger picture as well uh, so the room that we're standing in is the gun room uh, now this was this is a room where the cadets and the midshipmen slept and this was their accommodation very bare bones yeah it's you not can it's, see. it's not luxurious that is not a word i would use to describe this uh, this no, space no not not the ritz not at all <laughs> so who was who was who was using this room what were they using it for um, so you had your midshipmen and your cadets. They were sort of officers in training, um, and this is where they put them. Uh, so they stayed here uh, when they weren't on duty. Of course, they had other things they were probably doing when they weren't on duty, like hanging out with people, you know, eating, that sort of thing. But if they had to sleep or they wanted some time alone, this is where they came. Of course, you use the term alone very loosely here. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing about the Navy. I think you're never really alone, are you? But I mean, that's I'm just right. looking around. We've got what, six, seven bunk beds here, and I assume there would be more at various times. Lockers here. I mean, that's not a lot of space for all these men and women to, to keep their stuff in. I mean, you know, is this, is this typical of a, a locker set up during the uh, yes. James one? Tell us all about it. I mean, does this represent you know, how, how the lockers were set up during the time she was at sea? Yeah, uh, I mean, this, if you can imagine, uh, if you're a cadet or a mid who's um, staying in this, uh, this room, <laughs> this represents everything you own, pretty much. Uh, you know, you have to fit your dress uniforms in here, your u work uniforms, your civilian clothing, any other, uh, you know, your, your manuals, your books, anything that you need has to go right here in this very confined space and uh you know it's it's hard to imagine um but that's what you had to do um space is at a premium you know and warships were not uh you know they, they were not meant for pleasure cruises they had a job uh and that job was potentially fighting a war so um a lot of the space the majority of the space was devoted to the weapon systems you know devoted to the radar devoted to everything that you needed to make this ship functional as a warship. So um, things like space for your clothing and everything else it didn't quite matter as much. And so you had to fit everything right in there. Yeah, that's, I think that's the word. Not a lot of space, I think, sums up you know, the rooms we've seen so far. This is a cramped environment. I mean, it must have been pretty difficult for the crew a lot of the time. I mean, there's, there's the old saying about war that it's months of tedium followed by hours of terror. Yeah. And I mean, this, this sums it up. I mean, what was life like on board this ship when it was just patrolling the seas, when it wasn't in action? Oh, well, it, it definitely uh, would have been cramped. Uh, you would have had to have gotten along with the people that you were in accommodation with. Uh, I'm sure that disagreements broke out, fights broke out. I, mean, I can imagine trying to be in this room and you've got one, two, maybe three other people who are snoring while you're trying to sleep. Uh, one of the ways that they, that they would have combated that was to um, have shifts. So not everybody would have been in here at one time. I would imagine maybe part of the people who, who bunked in here were, were working um, and the other people were not. So they, they swapped out a bit. But it would have been difficult. Yeah, very close quarters. Uh, you have to get to know your, your crewmates very well. And... I think that's why you find, actually, uh, in talking with uh, men and women who served aboard naval vessels during that period, and even today, is that um, they do, they form those very strong bonds with one another, because you had to. And over time, you know, it, that develops into some very strong friendships. How many people are we talking about on this ship at any one time? Oh, you would have been talking at least two to three hundred people. Um, 
and <laughs> I just can't imagine. It's cramped quarters for that it, many And it would have been hectic, you know. Um, it, there would have been times of tedium, absolutely, uh, where they were on long deployments and they're just kind of going from one place to another. Not much is happening. But I also would imagine they were frequently doing drills. They might have been called to action stations because there was an unusual vessel in the vicinity. So there were moments, certainly, where I bet these guys were up and running about and doing what they had to do. There's a garden. What a garden. Only happy faces bloom there. And there's never James, obviously uh, an important part of the ship, the nerve centre here. I'm suspecting this is where uh, most of the, the work went on to point the ship where it needed to go and to, uh, to operate it in combat situations. What, where are we standing right now? That's right. This is the ops room, uh, the operations room. So this is the room where the captain and his officers uh, entered during uh, action stations. So when the ship went to action stations, combat situation, uh, they came to this room. And uh, this is where all the operations of the vessel were directed uh, during action stations. So, um, the captain sat in this chair. Um, you can see he's got an array of uh, hand pieces uh, to talk to people in other areas of the ship. Uh, Not just an array of hand pieces. I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six. There's, there's six telephones, um, voice transmitters. There's a speaking tube here. I mean, yep. this is this is. Uh, this is the, obviously the nerve center of the ship. It is, it absolutely is. Um, <laughs> it had a really interesting nickname. It was called the Bat Cave uh, during the ship's uh, operational career. Well, of uh, course, Vampire, the Bat yeah, Cave. It makes vampire sense. Vampire Bat, and this of course was the Bat Cave because it's dark <laughs> like a cave. It's got lots of interesting equipment and kit, uh, kind of like the Bat Cave from the Batman comics. So it was a very appropriate nickname. Um, but you're right, yes. Every conceivable communications link you can think of is right here. Um, that's throughout the ship, ship to ship, ship to shore, and you'll notice that not only do you have your high-tech means of communication, as you pointed out, you also have voice pipes everywhere. So in the event this is all knocked out, they can still communicate. Maybe not as widely and as effectively, but they can still do it. Um, one interesting thing about this room is that there was a tomahawk that was kept in here. And the reason for that was, in the event it looked like the ship was going to be captured, the Tomahawk would be brought out to smash all the cipher machines up and destroy all the top secret and sensitive communications equipment. So even in a room as, for the time, as technologically advanced as this one was, it's still old technology. If the ship's going to be overrun, physically smash the machines. That's exactly right. And the other thing that they had was there was a hatch in here. Um, where they would put all the code books, all the top secret documents. It looked like the ship was going to be captured, and it would be put into a weighted canvas bag, dropped overboard, so that they could get rid of that information so it couldn't be captured. So James, we're standing now in the bridge. This was obviously, uh, you know, the room to determine where the ship went. Um, she had quite an interesting history, didn't she, this ship? Particularly during the Vietnam era, that was probably her most dangerous and most important work of her entire career. Yeah, that's right. Um, Vampire served as a, an escort for troop ships that were running up to Vietnam from Australia. Um, so she did about 25 voyages. Um, and uh, yeah, simply served as an escort. Um, in the event enemy vessels might have attempted to attack one of these troop ships, uh, HMAS Sydney was the one that Vampire frequently uh, operated with. Um, it was here to provide protection. Well, I think that's going to be really important for our audience members because we have a lot of people that, uh, that tune in who either served in Vietnam themselves or had family members who served. And a lot of those men that went to Vietnam went on board the Sydney. It was one of the, you know, the, the, the most famous ships that carried people to Vietnam. Yeah. So it's amazing to think that we're standing now. You know, imagine what the view from this bridge would have been like uh, 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, uh, escorting those ships uh, uh, to Vietnam. Um, and always the risk of, uh, of coming into enemy contact. Well, that's right. And, uh, you know, particularly during that era, um, you know, the danger came from the sea and the danger came from the air. And uh, probably more likely from the air uh, was, was the concern, you know, so you had to, had to stay sharp and uh, you're trying to protect not only yourself, but you're trying to protect all the ships under your protection. So it was a very, uh, very involved role. It was dangerous or potentially dangerous. And uh, I know that, uh, yeah, it would have been a fairly uh, intense situation to be in uh, the closer you got to Vietnam. Vampire's days on the high seas are over. 
Never again will she echo with the sounds of her crew rushing to action stations or the roar of gunfire on a distant target. Today the shout of orders has been replaced with the laughter of visiting schoolchildren. And yet she still continues to serve, not as an implement of war, but as a reminder of service and sacrifice, and as a link to a past that should never be forgotten. <laughs>